Thank you, choir. That was awesome. Awesome. Wonderful. Um, they will know that we are Christians by our love. Isn't that what the Lord Jesus said um, in John 13, verse 34? And you commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Thank you, choir, for reminding us of that awesome truth, an important truth. Let me invite you to open your Bibles now to the book of Jeremiah. We're just going to look at one verse, Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 5. Jeremiah 1, 5. The Bible says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your perfect word. We ask your blessings on the reading of it, the preaching of it, the hearing of it. We ask in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. On January 22nd, 1973, 37 years from next Friday, in a case called Roe v. Wade, the United States Supreme Court ruled 7-2 to two that states may not ban abortions during the first three months of pregnancy and may regulate but may not ban abortions during the second trimester of pregnancy. Since that ruling, almost 51 million babies have been legally aborted in America. Understanding this is a controversial issue in our nation, understanding the controversy around the abortion debate, I would like for us to consider this issue this morning in church. The question in my mind at the heart of the matter is, is abortion murder or not? And the question that goes along with that question is, when does life begin? Well, the Bible, through Jeremiah's testimony, through Psalm 139, we heard that from Sherilyn earlier, is that life begins at conception. The Bible clearly testifies to that truth. Obviously, the 1973 U.S. Supreme Court disagreed. So let's take some time to look at three questions surrounding the abortion debate. First of all, I believe the most important question is, whose life is it? Whose life is it? When the Supreme Court made its ruling, it didn't directly answer the question of when life begins. Instead, it focused upon who decides when it begins. The court ruled that a fetus is not a, and I'm quoting now, person with constitutional rights, end quote. Furthermore, it ruled that the 14th Amendment to the Constitution protects a woman's right to choose to have an abortion. So what does the Bible say? That's what the Supreme Court of the United States said. What does the Bible say? Well, we just looked at Jeremiah 1.5. God is speaking to Jeremiah there at the beginning of the book, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Psalm 139 and verse 16. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book 
They all were written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. Clearly, without question, the Bible states life begins at conception. That's the Bible's stand. You can argue against it if you would like, but that's what the Bible says. You've got to tear out some pages. The Bible speaks clearly on that. But I mean, really, didn't, didn't we already know that? I mean, really? When Tina and I were expecting our children, all three of them, we went to Tina's doctor's visit together. I didn't miss any of them. If she went, I went. The first several of those visits to the physician would be listening events. We would listen to our baby's heart beating inside of Tina. And then after a few weeks into the pregnancy, the Bible, the Bible, the doctor would rub this jelly. Looked like it would be cold to me. Would, would rub this jelly on Tina's tummy. And then we would watch this ultrasound, and we would see these, these, these back then, these grainy images of our children inside of Tina. As the pregnancy progressed, we would see an arm move, and a hand, a leg. Clearly, clearly, it was a human being inside of a mother's womb. Don't tell me, don't tell me babies aren't people. Infants or um, fetuses, whatever you want to, aren't people inside of their mother's womb. They are living human beings. People with rights and privileges just like any other American. And with all due respect, and I'm serious, with all due respect, those seven justices on the 1973 U.S. Supreme Court were wrong. And Roe versus Wade needs to be reversed, and I'm praying that it will. Well, secondly, second question is how many is too many? For about 40 years now, and it's, and it's not as bad now as it was because you'll see, but for about 40 years now, we have been hearing warnings about the overpopulation of the earth. As a matter of fact, ever since 1968, when Paul Ehrlich introduced us to the term overpopulation, it was his term, in his book, The Population Bomb, we've been worried about global starvation, about massive energy and food shortages on our, on our, on, on our planet. The United Nations, with the help of, of organizations like Planned Parenthood, proposed that population control was quickly becoming a question of survival of our planet. And as a result, abortion was viewed as a practical way to deal with the population problem. And nations around the world, especially in second and third world nations like, like, like China, like the former Soviet Union, where millions times millions times millions times millions of babies were aborted for years and years and years. Those nations adopted population controls, resulting in more and more and more and more abortions. In his 1990 sequel to the population bomb, the population explosion, Ehrlich claimed that, the, that, that grain production peaked in 1986. while the world's population was exploding. He wrote that in 1986, 1 1.8 trillion metric tons of cereal grains were produced by the world's farmers. He warned us that the world's food supply would be dwindling from that point on. He said starvation would grip the earth and millions and millions of people would die 
simply because there wasn't enough food. They would starve to death. Sounds pretty scary, doesn't it? He scared a lot of people with his books. The problem is, he's wrong. Listen. According, according to the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization itself, according to, the, to that organization, in 2001, 20.7 trillion metric tons of cereal grains were produced by the world's farmers. That's a pretty big increase from 1.8 trillion. So the truth is, the truth is, while certainly, clearly, the world's population is exploding, it is growing incredibly fast, well, so is the food supply. In 1968, there were 2,371 calories available per person per day from the, for, for the whole world from the world's food supply. In 2010, the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization estimates there'll be 2,730 calories available per person per day for every person in the world. Furthermore, in 2002, the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization reported that the average calorie intake per person per day in the world has increased by 17% over the last 30 years, while the population of the world has increased by 70%. You see, the point of that is the overpopulation myth is just that. It's a myth. It's just, it's just not true. The truth is God is providing plenty of food for the world. So we don't have a problem of world hunger? No, we, we have a huge problem of world hunger. World hunger is a huge problem. But it's not a problem of supply. It's a problem of distribution. It's a problem of sin. It's a problem of stewardship. It's a problem of selfishness and evil and wickedness. And to kill babies in the name of overpopulation is wickedness upon wickedness. It's evil. So thirdly, finally, let's, let's, let's get to the heart of the matter. Is abortion murder? Is it murder? We, we looked at two questions. Whose life is it and how many is too many? But the key question is, is abortion murder? Well, like Tina and I and, and millions, millions more, and most of you have heard heartbeat of a baby in the womb of its mother. You've heard that. We've seen pictures. Now you can see them in 3D. <laughs> On the ultrasound. Now listen, I, I'm not a physician and I, I don't claim to be one. But I know a heartbeat when I hear one. I know a hand and fingers move when I see one. telling you, babies in their mother's womb have a heartbeat. And without question, abortion stops a beating heart. That's a matter of fact. It's that simple. So what does the Bible say? That's reason. What does the Bible say? Does the Bible consider abortion to be murder. Well, you want to mark this passage in your Bibles. Maybe you haven't seen it. Exodus chapter 21. We're going to go to God's courtroom. Exodus chapter 21, beginning in verse 22. Listen to this passage. If men fight and hurt a woman with child, so that she gives birth prematurely, yet no harm follows, he shall surely be punished accordingly as the woman's husband imposes on him. 
and he shall pay as the judges determine. Understand, this is a child that has been injured. But, as the passage continues, but if any harm follows, then you shall give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, strike for strike. We've already said the Bible clearly, clearly states that a baby in its mother's womb is a living human being of great worth. That God knows us even while we were yet in our mother's womb. But notice in this text, in Exodus 21, if the child is only injured, the penalty is the woman's husband's choice. It's the father's choice. He has a say in this. <laughs> he has a say. But notice, if the child dies, this is so interesting. If the child dies, neither the woman nor the husband, nor the, neither the mother nor the father has any say. They don't have any say in the judgment. God does. And he imposes the same penalty as he does for one who would take any other life. Do the Bible study. According to the law, if you kill a person, life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Well, here, in Exodus 21, verses 23 to 325, if a woman is with child and she's injured and the child dies, God sees that loss of life just exactly the same way as he sees any other loss of human life. Life for life. The Bible teaches abortion is the killing of innocent human life. But we know that. We, we know that. Deep down inside, we've always known that. Wrong is wrong. And deep down inside, we know right from wrong. I mean, we live in a society filled with contradiction. One woman goes to the physician and Here's the heartbeat of her baby and celebrates. Another woman in the same week of pregnancy goes to a physician and has an abortion. It's the woman's choice. Who chooses for the child? Where's the child's advocate? not going to be the government, who's it going to be? It's got to be us. It's got to be us. Now, certainly, one solution is, is, is adoption. One solution is adoption. Adoption should be made easier, cheaper, and quicker. Because it's not, it's a sin. We have to be ashamed of ourselves as a nation that it's not. It's too difficult, it's too complicated, it's too expensive. It's ridiculous. I think both sides of this argument would agree on that. But I want to tell you a true story as I close about abortion and adoption. In the early 1960s when abortion was not a legal option, a young high school student met the man of her dreams. So she allowed him to have his way with her. And soon she became pregnant. He told her he was going to college and wanted nothing to do with her or her baby. 
Her uncle found a place that cared for unwed mothers, and she gave birth to a beautiful baby girl, and that child was adopted. A few years later, she met a man while working in a factory. He told her that he loved her. She moved in with him, and before too long, she became pregnant again. When the man learned of her pregnancy, he kicked her out of his home and out of his life. He told her he didn't want to have anything to do with her. Not knowing what to do, she went back to the uncle who had helped her the first time, but this time the uncle suggested that she get an abortion to solve her problem. But she refused. So the uncle kicked her out. She was on her own. So pregnant with nowhere to go, she moved into a Salvation Army shelter where she lived to the birth of child. In time, she gave birth to a beautiful little boy. Because there was no way for her to care for this baby, he was placed in a foster home. Eventually, he was adopted into a loving Christian family. His name was Stephen. Stephen was raised in church, but life was difficult for Stephen. His adopted parents were killed on the same day at the same time in the same automobile accident in his early 20s. So Stephen, not knowing what to do or where to go, joined the Army. He went on to serve in the 10th Mountain Infantry, Infantry Division for four years. After the Army, he went to college, and he graduated from college. He married. Eventually, he had children of his own. That's not the end of Stephen's story. God called Stephen to ministry. Today, he serves as pastor of a Southern Baptist church in Illinois. And in just one year earlier this decade, more than 75 people were born again into the kingdom of God through Stephen's ministry. You see, what the world calls an unplanned pregnancy, God calls a miracle. Because the truth is, God has a plan for every child ever conceived. And over the last 37 years, our nation has legally ended the lives of nearly 51 million people. And I've got some sad news for you on that. God's going to judge us for that. God's going to judge our nation for that holocaust. Maybe he already is. Because without question, abortion stops a beating heart. I know that any time we gather with 51 million Abortions, that there's someone here that's had an abortion, or you know someone that's had an abortion, and you need to know, you need to hear, God loves you, God forgives. There's redemption through the shed blood of the Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. There's forgiveness. We need to accept God's forgiveness forgive ourselves and let God live his life through us and be good stewards of what he gives us. And every time we stand up for the unborn, we need to share that word, that truth. That's the other side of the coin that sometimes in this debate gets ignored. 
but it shouldn't. But God has given us life that we might be the advocate of the unborn. And we need to speak out and we need to do whatever we can do. However the God however God equips us, whatever doors he opens to stand up and to stand out for life. Thank God for Piedmont Women's Center, other ministries like theirs across our nation. Thank God for state legislatures that are voting, trying their hardest, many pro-life leaders trying to make it a law where women have to see an ultrasound of their child and they'll see that's a living human being inside of them before they can have an abortion. Thank God for that. We need to do all we can do as God's stewards, as Americans, to protect the unborn. Let's pray together. Father, we know that this is a wound in our nation's soul. God, we've allowed it to happen in our in our our nation. We pray, God, that you would raise up pro-life leaders in our courts, in our government, who are unashamed and unafraid to do what's right. God, we pray that churches across this land, all denominations, would just simply read your word, preach it and proclaim it. Life is a gift from you. You have a plan for every life that has ever been conceived. To end it on purpose prematurely is a vile sin. God, forgive us for that. Forgive us for being silent. And we ask you, Lord, to provide opportunities for us to speak and to act. And we ask all of these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. If you're here today and, and you've never prayed to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord, that is clearly and simply the most important decision anyone can possibly ever make. So I urge you to be here. If you were to die today, do you know for sure you'd go to heaven? If you would say, well, I hope so, you need to know so. <laughs> That's not something you should hope for. I hope the Braves would have won the World Series last year. That didn't happen. Eternal life is not something you play with. It's something God gives us an opportunity like he is right now, invitations. Come to him. You need to come. Or maybe, maybe you are a believer. Maybe you're a Christian. And just to be honest, you've been living outside of his will. God's calling you to come home. You need to come. You need to run. Maybe God's calling you to join this church. I don't know how he's speaking, but I know he's speaking because he speaks to his church and he speaks to us when we gather in his name. So I know he's speaking to us. We need to be obedient. We need to be honest. We need to come as he calls. So, uh, Sherilyn, you come and lead us.